Yeah. Praise God. So, Pastor Les, I asked Pastor Les if he would come and uh, minister to us this morning. He has a message from the Lord. Praise God. And thank you, Pastor Les, for, for being willing to come and praise God. Love you, brother. And, you know, I, I have a sense the Lord sent you our way. Ain't that wonderful? And uh, I, I love and appreciate you. So, here, everybody the Lord, okay? Oh, you've got one. I've got one. Oh, I Amen. Didn't see that. Okay. Thank you. Woo! How do I follow with that? I don't know. <laughs> um, one reason Doreen and I and Anna Mae come here to, to uh, Grace is because of the liberty that is here, the freedom to let the Spirit move. And uh, John is, is not one of those guys who holds on his pul- pulpit and fights everybody off. He. He says, this is open, let the Lord move, and uh, I believe the Lord has given me something today that is for this congregation, for us, and uh, uh, before, I, before I start, though, I want to say one thing. There's, there was a young preacher uh, who had just been preaching a few, few weeks, maybe a few months, uh, just kind of trying it out, getting started, and after the service one day, one of the people in the congregation, one of the men came up to him afterwards, shaking hands as they were going out the door, and and this brother in the congregation says, uh, Pastor, uh, that was a good message this morning. I really heard something. I I think I really heard something from God. And the young pastor says, oh, oh, shucks. (laughs) No, man, man, it was God. It was just God. It was all God. It was not, not me. It wasn't me. It was just all God. It was all God. And the brother says, I didn't say it was that good. <laughs> so this, this may not be all God, but I think maybe God's in this somewhere. So, so pay attention and uh, see if you can catch what the Lord is saying. Let me just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege and the honor of speaking to, to this family, to my family, Lord, the brothers and sisters uh, that walk together and love one another and, and uh, are are one team to serve you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege. And we just ask, Father, that your spirit that we've been singing about and proclaiming uh, would anoint this word today and that it would touch our hearts. We would learn something from you, Lord, from your scripture, from your word, and by the witness of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, the Son of God, Yeshua ben Yehovah, I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I want to talk today about the most important prayer meeting in the history of the world. And anybody uh, think you know what that is? Nobody? Raise your hand if you think you know what I'm talking about. The most important prayer meeting in world history. All right? Well, I'll give you a couple clues. Two clues. First one, number one, only four people attended... (laughs) And number two, three of them fell asleep. Now you get, are you getting there? You know where we are? I'm talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. Talking about where, where Jesus prayed before he was betrayed by Judas and, and in a few hours was crucified. This This moment, this time in the garden, this prayer meeting with only four people and three of them sleeping through it, I believe is the most important prayer meeting in the history of the world, even though just one person ended up praying. And I'll show you why this morning, and I I believe you'll you'll be able to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, the, The place where he was praying is called Gethsemane. You see, uh, that's actually an olive press that you're seeing there. Uh, This is how how they would take ripe olives and turn them into olive oil. All right? How do you take nice, juicy, ripe olives and turn them into olive oil? Well, you put them in this thing, kind of circular... Uh, thing and then you roll that big weight around. Sometimes it's a great big one and it's 
It's got a, a stick coming out of it and a donkey hooked on the end of it, and he just keeps walking around and around and around. And what the, what the process is, is that you have to crush those beautiful ripe olives. And by the way, the, the olives in Israel, when you go to Israel, the olives you get in Israel are like nothing I found anywhere else in the world. They're so, so scrumptious. I love them. Uh, and, and so you take these beautiful olives. They're good to eat by themselves. But if you crush them, just crush them, to just this weight just goes over and over and over. It, it produces the oil that, that's in those olives is pressed out. That's why it's called an olive press, okay? It's not a coincidence that this is where Jesus prayed this important prayer. It was in Gethsemane, the olive press. Some of us have been there. We've stood there in Jerusalem. We will do that again in September. We'll be at that place. You'll, we'll be in a little grove of olive trees on the Mount of Olives. Some of them, some of the experts say that may have actually been that in that very place 2,000 years ago. They're that old. Olive trees can live more than 2,000 years. And so some very old olive trees in this area. And it's probably the, the, near the place, at least, where Jesus prayed. And, and uh, part of what we, what we enjoy as we get into the Bible and start reading it is when we connect it to reality. It's, not a, it's just not a religious thing. It's not something somebody made up. It's actually a revelation of, of God's purpose and reality. And uh, so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to see the cross through the eyes of Jesus. This is a whole different thing. Uh, and uh, I want you to see it kind of point by point. I think all of them came up here at the same time. But uh, we're going to go through them point by point. And understand, what I want you to do is kind of uh, step back a second and look at the big picture, the big picture of, of what's really going on here that's, that comes to this, this culmination, this point in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. There, kind of all of history ends up funneling into this one moment of Jesus praying in the Garden. And, and before history, before uh, Adam and Eve were created, there was, a, there was a rebellion in heaven. Satan, who is Lucifer, a beautiful covering cherub, an angel or a, a, a creation of God, uh, was, had all this great purpose in God. We'll talk about it in a minute. But he, it's, the Bible says uh, iniquity was found in him. Uh, unrighteousness was found in him. And a lot of theologians discuss, what, you know, what is that? What is this unrighteousness? What are we talking about? How did that happen? What, what in the world? How, why did Satan blow his estate in heaven and, and end up being the devil, all right? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. But I want to, what, I, what I want you to see is the cross through Jesus' eyes. We think of the cross, and it's appropriate, as for what it means for us, <laughs> all right? Because that's our salvation. Jesus had to die on the cross. His blood had to be shed for us to be saved. But he was the eternal son before creation. Jesus was with God. He wasn't created. He is God. Jesus is God the Son. Uh, we, we've come to understand that the name of God is Jehovah or Yahweh or Jehovah, different pronunciations. But, but Jehovah God the Father has a son, Yeshua. Yeshua is... If you, if you said his name in Hebrew, it would really be Yeshua ben Yehovah, Jesus, son of God. All right? That's, that would be his name. That's who Jesus is. He, was, he had that before creation. In fact, he helped with creation. He, he created. He was part of creation. All right? He created the universe. Uh, I want to say something about the universe uh, that's just come out recently in, in news and science. Uh, there's a new telescope up there, not the Hubble, but what's another one called? Web. web, the Webb telescope. They've discovered something with this new telescope that actually uh, cancels out a lot of the science uh, perspective and what science has been teaching about what they call the Big Bang Theory. Uh, we call it creation. <laughs> God created. Uh, but... But they've been teaching all, for years and years and years, science says 
that there's this big bang, something happened here kind of at the beginning, and then it kind of evolved and developed and grew. And they actually, their doctrine has been that the, the creation at the beginning of this was just little baby galaxies, a, a few suns and so forth, and they just kept expanding and expanding and expanding until we get where we are today. Well, this new telescope, the Webb scope, telescope, has actually been able to see further back in time, all the way back to the Big Bang, to that moment when everything came into being. And what they found is that at that time, the universe was full of mature galaxies, billions of them, just beyond our ability to even grasp. In other words, there's, there's science that this idea of evolving and cre you know, developing contradicts what, what, the, what science is now saying. <laughs> they, they may change their mind again. I don't know. They, you know they, they have to do that because they have to keep facing reality. But I, I like to say that when Adam and Eve were created, if you walked into the garden and you saw Adam the day after he was created, you would probably judge him to be like, I don't know, 20 years old, kind of an optimum, you know, healthy young life. And, uh, and yet he was just created the day before out of the dust of the ground. <laughs> you know, I believe that, by the way. I, I take that literally. I believe if, if you can possibly take a scripture literally, you should do so. Yes. And the only reason not to take that li literally is to say God couldn't do that. <laughs> well, God could do that. So I believe he did. And, uh, and if you cut down a big 120-foot uh, oak tree in the Garden of, e of Eden, I think it would have rings in it. That's just my opinion. But I think you could kind of say, oh, this tree's 150 years old or whatever. And yet it was just created yesterday. <laughs> all right? In other words, God created the universe with all the, all the dimensions already. And Jesus created the universe. Now, here's the point. He left out all that. He actually left that glorious place as the Son of God to come to earth, to die for us, to shed his blood for our sins because there was no one worthy to do that other than him. He was the only option in the story and it's important that we get that. So he had to give, he had to come to the earth. Now, one little, one little thing that a lot of people miss is that in order to come to the earth, he had to give up his deity. Philippians 2, I'm not talking about that today, but you can look at it. And he emptied himself of his deity and came to this earth as a human being without deity. It's important to understand that because it comes into the story here. So he emptied himself of his deity. You know, all of his superpowers, you know, left his cape in heaven, left all his x-ray vision, whatever, you know, everything was left behind. And he came formed in as a, really, placed in Mary's womb as a sperm. I don't want to get into that, but you know. <laughs> but, and then he was developed as a baby in her womb. By the way, is, Scott, has your daughter had her baby yet? No. <laughs> Be delivered in Jesus' name. <laughs> Think of Jesus and all the glory he had with the Father in eternity, submitting to be put into a young girl's womb and develop for nine months, totally helpless, then born through the birth canal and all that goes with that. I don't need to describe it. And then to be raised by Joseph and Mary. You know all, of, all the story of his life. But he left all that he had to come and save the lost. He laid aside his deity. He accepted the limitations of humanness as a man to die for us. Now, why did he have to do that? Because by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. And by one man, Jesus Christ, our sin was forgiven. So a man sinned, a man had to atone for that sin. So Jesus had to be a man in the most literal sense in order to qualify. It was one of the qualifications to die for us is that he be a man, not an angel, not a cherub or a seraphim or anybody. He had to be 
a man. And, of course, he had to be sinless, and we'll get to that. All right, now there's a picture I want you to see here that's pretty interesting. And uh, this is actually an actual uh, uh, rendering from radiography, nuclear magnetic resonance, and cryo-electron microscopy. That's a mouthful, isn't it? But basically what it is is a picture of the inside of a human cell. Now, I just talked about the universe and the billions of galaxies, all right? And yet in one human cell, look at the intricate stuff going on in there, <laughs> all right? God is so amazing. Yeah. Jesus is so amazing. He created this. He created man and then became one. That's... You know, it blows a few circuits, I know. <laughs> you know, I, I don't get that. You know how that happens, how that worked. I just know God could do it because he's God and he can do anything. So, so now let's talk, let's start zeroing a little bit. So Jesus, I'm, I'm talking about the cross through Jesus' eyes, right? What was he, what was going on with him? All right, so we have the problem of, of the devil in heaven. Now let's talk about the devil for a minute. I'm not, this, I, I'm not going to glorify the devil. In fact, <laughs> you'll see that this does not glorify him ultimately. But it says in the Bible, it says in uh, Ezekiel 28, and read more in that chapter. I'm only using a few verses. So read Ezekiel 28 and also read Isaiah 14. We'll get to both of those. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, who were we talking about? Who was in Eden? Let's name the, name the folks that were in Eden. Adam, Eve, God, the serpent. Satan. That was the only one. There's nobody else there. <laughs> All right? So, so when we have a scripture that says, you were in Eden, then it has to be one of those four people, one of those four personalities. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. This is the English, standard, or English uh, version, ESV. Uh, some translations translate that uh, you were crafted in gold and your timbrels and your pipes. It uses the phrase timbrels and pipes. Uh, and and that's an, that is an uh, appropriate uh, one, one option for translating that word in the Greek, timbrels and pipes. The reason I'm kind of stopping here on that for a second is that I want you to uh, just think of a little, this one one thing that I feel like the Lord showed me, and you can judge that for yourself. But I think Satan, as in his creation, not only was he just incredibly, incre you can't even picture this. Can you picture a creature that looks with like all these gemstones? You can, I mean, I, I can't, I, you know, I can't, you, you can't picture that. And, but then if, if you use this timbrels and pipes idea that I believe he was musical. I, I think that's why he use, is able to use music so well against us uh, today, because uh, I believe he was created with incredible music ability. In fact, I like to, I like to, uh, you know, think, let my imagination go a little bit once in a while, and I actually picture Satan as Lucifer, this great uh, personage in heaven, one of the highest people, one of the highest creations of God. I picture him as being like a musical instrument. Like, you know, I can make music, you know? Uh, and, and man has developed all these beautiful instruments. What if Satan himself, or Lucifer, was a musical being that even his very breath and, but not just a whistle, but an entire symphony of music and sound and beautiful chords. And it would be chords, it wouldn't be dissonance in the way he was created. Okay? He was this incredibly beautiful creature. I want to go on to the second part. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. So here we have biblical evidence that Satan was created, or this person in the garden, which has to be him. You were created, they were prepared, you were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you 
God is saying. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in all your ways. Raise your hand, you, if you're blameless in all your ways. <laughs> Doesn't apply to us, but it applied to the devil. From the day he was created, he was blameless in all his ways. What happened? You were, un, you were blameless from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Unrighteousness, iniquity, rebellion, sin, you know, all the different words we might use. Well, what was that? Do we, do we have a clue? I think we do. Let's go to the other scripture in Isaiah 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of David. Dawn, I mean, excuse me, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Five times he declares, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. That, friends, is the unrighteousness that was found in his heart. He went from being a servant of the Most High God, Jehovah, to completely turning inward and serving only himself. He became self-conscious and self-motivated and self-everything. You know, I... Uh, I don't know if anybody here is an, a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but you know that you know what the actual literal uh, meaning of psychology is. The psychology, suke is the Greek word that, that 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 English word comes from, and suke means self. It means soul. It's the self. It's our personal, who we are, our own identity. It's who we are. Myself. I'm myself. It's my mind, my will, my my emotions. Uh, my thoughts, my, it's, it's who I am, okay? That's the self. And, uh, you know, sadly, uh, one of the most, one of the highest incidents of, of suicides among professional people is psychologists. Because psychology means study of self. And so they're dealing with people on the soul level, on the self level. And if they don't know Jesus, if the psychologist doesn't know Jesus, <laughs> they're trying to solve Satan's stuff, <laughs> you know, and all this selfishness without the answer. It's a very dangerous place to be. If you're going to go into that field, I'd recommend you meet Jesus before you do it. Five times he says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. This is the character, the nature of Lucifer, when he rebelled from God, he became selfish. You've probably heard the simple definition of we're three part being spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, the spirit dimension of us, we invite the Holy Spirit to come in and, and join with our spirit and worship God, and we, we take you know, a whole new uh, position under God when we, when we do that. And so the spiritual dimension is our God consciousness. The soul is our self consciousness. And of course, the body is a world consciousness, what we see, hear, smell, touch, the physical part. Those are the three parts. And most people uh, were born with, without a relationship with the Lord. We have to be born again in, in order to be saved and to follow Jesus. And before that, we, we developed this strong, you know, I am, I'm my own man. I'm, I set my own destiny, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And, 
You know, I'm no, no, yes, no, 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 I'm in charge, right? And that is strong, strong in all of us. So when we get saved, we get born again, we get baptized in the Spirit, start speaking in tongues and worshiping Jesus. Sometimes, sometimes I've seen some that are just like instantly everything changes. Sometimes it takes a while. <laughs> and part of the reason is because we have this great strong soul, soul man in us, ourself, and we need to, as David prayed, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Bless Jehovah. David speaks from his spirit to his self. It says, self, line up with God. Worship Jehovah. That's what we're supposed to do, right? So, so this is the problem. So before creation, when in heaven, all this going on, this is why Jesus had to come. You, you got that? All right. Now, he came, uh, and, and this, this particular day uh, that we're, uh, we're experiencing today is called Palm Sunday. I want to suggest, or not suggest, but I want to inform you that Jesus didn't know anything about Palm Sunday. All right? He was in Jerusalem because he was in Jerusalem every year. From the time, at least, you know, as a young boy, every male in Israel all over the land can, had to come up to Jerusalem for Passover in the spring. Every single man had to do it. Sometimes they brought their families and so forth. But so on... On Passover week in Jerusalem, there would be as many as two million people. In other words, all the men in the country <laughs> came into town, right? And Jerusalem's on a, a higher, on a mountain, so no matter where you are, you have to go up to Jerusalem. It's called Aliyah, going up. So, so Jesus didn't come to Jerusalem on this particular morning because it was Palm Sunday. He came to Jerusalem to observe Passover, okay? Had his disciples preparing it and so forth, and that was going to happen in a few days. So, so, what, so what was the deal with all these people waving their palm branches and saying, wow, this guy is Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel? Who was this? Why, why, would, why were they doing that? Well, they heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead, heard about several blind people who were here. People had been crippled all their lives. And on and on and on. They heard all of these things. This is the guy that we've been waiting for. Woohoo! Man, you know, let's go on. So they heard him coming into town. And they, they just, he's our hero. Three or four days later, these same people were saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! We want Barabbas! Same people. This wasn't about recognizing that Jesus was the Messiah of God. It was, maybe he can help me with me, with my problems, myself. Maybe I can get something from him. Okay? That was their heart. That was their attitude. So this, this gathering, this week, from Jesus' perspective, was to come into town for Passover. And he knew it was his last one. But he'd been doing it with the disciples for three years. And he'd been doing it with his family for, you know, 30, 33 years or, or however much. So in the middle of the week, he's sitting down at Passover. We call it the Last Supper. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That's what we say at the communion service, Right? We need to remember Jesus and, and, you know, as we break the bread and so forth, and, and that's good. But, but it came from Jesus observing Passover with his disciples. And, and notice what he says there. I, I read it already, do this in remembrance of me, but let me read it with a different emphasis. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, what is the this? It's Passover. Do Passover in remembrance of me. Some churches do it every week. Some, people, some do it once a month, once a quarter, once a year. You know, different churches have communion different ways. I, I personally have a little bit of maybe an odd view of communion, but I think, 
I think we had communion yesterday morning with about 20 or 25 men at the men's breakfast. I mean, we were breaking bread, and we were drinking water <laughs> or coffee. We were fellowshipping, sharing testimonies, praying for one another. We had communion. Uh, my view, and, and excuse me, Pastor John, if this you know doesn't, doesn't bother anything here, but I think when we have the little wafer and the little tiny little thing, I think that's more of a symbol of the communion that we have every day with one another when we break bread together. That's communion. But the point is, whether it's Passover, whether it's a formal communion service at church or breaking bread, Jesus says, when you do this, remember me. Let me be there with you. I, I, like, I like to get on that. I like pizza. <laughs> Why not invite Jesus when you get pizza? All right, let's read these, some of these verses in Matthew. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over here and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, if you've been watching The Chosen, you probably know them by now. How many of you watch The Chosen? The rest of you need to watch The Chosen. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. All three, three, uh, three seasons now. Binge, binge it. You need to watch it. So Jesus said to the disciples, he had all 12 of them, and, or at least nine, 11 of them, I guess. Uh, or, uh, no, that'd be 10, because Judas was gone, the other ones. Anyway, had all of them come, but he said to most of them, you stay back, but, but I want Peter, James, and John to come with me and pray with me. So they go on, and he says, uh, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Sorrowful and troubled. Now, does this begin to sound a little dissonant? This is Jesus before the creation world. He knew his purpose is to come and to give his life. And now as it's down to, the, down to the moment, literally the very night before the betrayal, or the night that he gets betrayed, really, he's troubled. He's in sorrow. Even to death. I mean, it's, it's like he's feeling like death closing in on him somehow. Might, you know, probably is like a demonic attack of spirit of death, fear. And, you know, this is horrible, horrible, horrible. And uh, so he says, going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, wait a second. Jesus is praying to God and saying, I don't, want to, I don't want to do this. If it's possible, let's just skip this part. But then, that's part of him is saying that. Which part is that? His self, his soul, right? But then he says, but, Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Okay, got that settled? No. He, he, hadn't, he hadn't won yet. I want to make a statement that's shocking, but I think you will need to reckon, I think you'll recognize it's true. It was not Jesus' will to die and suffer on the cross. If we just take the scripture we're reading literally, not my will, but your will be done. So he goes on. Uh, came to the disciples, found them sleeping, said to Peter, so you cannot watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus himself is describing what he's experiencing here. Temptation. Jesus? Tempted? He's a son of God. Oh, wait a minute. No. He had laid that aside. He's now a man. 
with, with the limitations of humanness. He's not, he, he's not the deity. Now, there's old songs that he could have called 10,000 angels. Yes, he could. He could have prayed and asked God to send angels and whatever. But in terms of where he really was in that garden, he was human. And he was tempted to not go through with it. He was tempted. Really, really was. He really was tempted to not go through with it. Again, for the second time, he went away and pr prayed, My father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. Second time he prayed for it to plan B. No plan B. <laughs> this is the plan. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And so, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Jesus battled with himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was tempted to throw it all aside and not go through with it. He really was. Um, look at this next scripture verse from Hebrews 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect, in every respect, say every respect. every respect, in every respect has been tempted as we are, as we are, yet without sin. Was it sinful for Jesus to ask the Father for plan B? Was it sinful for him to struggle with his flesh, with his self? Evidently not, because it says without sin. He, he had all the temptations we have, but he didn't sin. So the temptation, our temptations that we all have, that's not the sin. The sin is when you follow up on what you're tempted. All right? Jesus three times asked for an escape route, and each time... He concluded by saying, not my will, but your will be done. Now, I want to get a little dramatic here. I'm not very dramatic normally. I've been watching John. I'm getting a little better. But <laughs> I, I want to suggest to you that the whole plan and purpose of God and the whole rebellion of Satan in heaven and being thrown out of heaven because he said, my will, my will, my will, my will, my will, set in motion the sin, and he got it into Adam and Eve, and it came down, and we inherited it ourselves. Your beautiful little baby is born in sin. We pray the Holy Spirit will bring the life of Jesus, and that's your responsibility to teach him. <laughs> that's right. right? But Satan was all about his own will, and, and here, here's where I picture it. I don't picture Jesus standing there like a, you know, a, a college a professor, you know, with umpteen degrees, PhDs, and all this standing there and saying, well, I thought it over, Father, and I decided not my will, but, but your will. I don't think that's the way it is. You know he sweat great drops of blood. You know that's the first blood that he was shed for our sins was actually in the garden before he got to the Romans beating him and all of that and the crown of thorns and then the cross and blood. The first blood was in the garden and it says he was tempted like we are. We've already mentioned that. And the next verse is there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. That's an encouragement. An angel was sent to, experience, to encourage, to strengthen the Son of God? Yes. No, the Son of Man. He was man at this point. And an angel came. And we're men and women, and if we need it, God will send an angel to, for us to strengthen yes, us. Will. See? Because what you're seeing here is Jesus lived our life for us, with us. You know, he, he played it out for us. But anyway, it goes on. And his sweat became like great drops of blood. Uh, medical science has actually demonstrated, proven, that under in in incredible stress, just when somebody's just, oh, oh, you know, and just talk about the things, Jesus, the sorrow, the pain, the agony, agony, it says, 
as he was praying in the garden. It was so intense that literally the capillaries in his skin burst from the stress. This is a medical thing. And the blood then came out through his sweat glands. When the capillaries burst, the blood went into his sweat glands and it came out and he sweat blood. So when he prayed this prayer, he didn't say, not my will. He said, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. That was the victory over Satan. That was the victory over the devil. The cross had to happen for, the, for him to be the Lamb of God, whose blood is for, for our sin. He had to do that. But the victory was in the garden. If he had said, I'm not doing this. I'm sorry, Father, I, I can't do it. Not, not going to happen. We'd still be in our sins. The devil would be, still be in charge. The devil's not in charge. He's got some liberty running around doing stuff. But God's in charge. Jesus is in charge. The Holy Spirit's in charge. Amen. Hebrews also says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. How, how far have you gone in resisting temptation? To, to where your stress created the capillaries bursting and blood? No. I don't think anybody, I don't know anybody that's resisted that much. Praise that, pray, pray that God gives us grace <laughs> without having to get that far and we make the, make the change. So Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. That, that did a number of things. Eight words that changed history. Not my will, but your will be done. Eight words that reversed the curse. The curse of Satan. What was the curse of Satan? Self-will. Self-identity. I think I'm going to identify as a frog. I like frogs. I think I'll just be a frog. Is that stupid? People are doing that. People are doing that. What? I don't like being a man. I think I'll be a woman. I'm going to, I'm going to identify as a woman. Sorry. <laughs> Doesn't change anything. Jesus reversed the curse with those eight words. You can too yes. in your life by saying, not my will, but thy will be done. These eight words will set you free. They'll set you free. Now, this final point I want to make is that it's not... This is, this is interesting. It's something the Lord spoke to me just this, a, a couple weeks ago as I was praying over this message. It was not Jesus' will to suffer and die on the cross. But it was his choice. Yes. It wasn't his will. It was not what he wanted. But it's what he chose. That's, that's how we should live. If we follow Jesus, we'll come up on stuff that the Lord's saying, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. I don't want to do that. That's, really? That's what you want me to do? I don't want to, but I choose to follow you, Jesus. So we're going to sing at the end here. I'm ready to sing, and I want to cheer you going to be able to sing that song we were talking about? Yes. All right, good. Look at this last verse. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Does that mean we're supposed to all get a, a cross and go up and 
have somebody nail us to the cross? No, no, no. That's not what it's saying. It's talking about this choice. This choice where you choose the cross rather than your own self, your own escape, your, what's good for you. You say, I'm with you, Father. I, I do what you want. I, I like to talk about this. I don't know whether I've done it here before or not. But if you want to understand God, how many would like to understand God? You want to understand God? If you want to understand God, you need to learn how to stand under God. Where is God? What's God doing? Here he is. All right, Lord. When you stand under God, you're saying, you're God and I'm not. So I'm going to say no to my own self will and yes to your will and your purpose. So I stand on it. Once you, once you learn this, once you assume the position and take that stand under God and you say, I'm, I'm just with you, whatever, but I'm with you, your life will change. Your life will change. That's the choice we have. We can choose that or we can choose our own self. So I'm, I'm asking you, let's stand, and I'm asking you this morning. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that from just about any, any given week here at uh, Grace, there are some people that have come in that have never actually decided to follow Jesus, never given your life to Jesus. I invite you to make that choice today and come up to the altar. The, the ministers of the altar can come and Take, take your places, but if you want to choose to follow Jesus today, if you want to make that choice, come to the altar and pray. Someone will pray with you if you'd like. If you'd like to pray alone, that's okay too. But you come. As we sing, you come. But then I also want to extend this to everybody else. I think the Spirit of God has been here today. And I believe God's spoken on, to people's hearts. And each of us have things going on in our lives. And I believe there are some who need to come to the altar and, and sing this song and make this confession. I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus, and I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to say, not my will, but your will be done. Can we do that? So let's come. Let's sing and, and, uh, and then come to the altar as the Lord leads. Thank you, Jesus. It's our choice, Lord, to follow you. Nobody's making us do this. Nobody's making me follow you. I choose to. It's my choice. Even when it's not my will, I choose to follow you, Lord Jesus. This is real. This is a real thing. And it really is the, the key. I have decided. Thank you, Lord. To follow Jesus, yes. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Hallelujah. No turning back. No turning back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No turning back. The world behind me. That's my choice. The uh, cross before me. I choose you, Lord. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. No turning back. No turning back.
of that song is, though none go with me, still I will follow. But Lord, what a wonderful promise is that you said you would never leave us or forsake us, even to the end. So you go with us, even if all of our friends and family and business partners abandon us. You said you will go with us. You've already been there and done that. And you know the way. That's why the early believers were called followers of the way. You showed us the way. The theological part of your blood is non-negotiable. We know about that. It's critical. But the personal choice involved, you showed us how to do that. You showed us. You showed us the way. And I thank you, Lord. And I just pray, Father God, that every single one of us standing here up front, everyone in the, in the entire room would be confirmed in a new way, deep, deep down inside of us, spirit, especially the soul and the body, that we will follow you in all dimensions, all three dimensions, not just in the spirit when we're in church, but in the soul. When we're out there rubbing shoulders and talking to people in the, out in the world, you are with us, and we will follow you. We will stand under you. You are God, and we are not. We follow you. Thank you for Jesus being tempted in every way like we are yet without sin. Thank you, Lord, that our sins are washed away because of that blood starting right there in the garden. Thank you, Father.